and welcome to Varmblog. And today I'm here with Colin Drum of member school fame, founder, primary intellect. Although first, you first are... among equals, as they say. <laughs> yeah, first among equals. Although I was about to say, you've expanded your uh, contributing um, organizers and associates and basically general scholars actually pretty significantly in the last year or so. Yeah, we've been growing quickly. You know, I mean, it, um, I mean, my my if if all I wanted to do was fund myself, I could stop where I was. But I that is that's not the that's not the project. So I'm trying to get uh, money in people's pockets. Um, so there, I mean, there's three core organizers, and we've we've brought on a couple fellows, and who are kind of mini organizers, and there's going to be more of those as our budget permits, basically. So uh, we, there's more there's more people who will be announced uh, soon who are going to be joining the roster. So yeah, that's uh, that's good news. I've been participating a little bit more and enjoying uh, some some of the courses that I've been auditing there, as well as some of the reading groups. Um, one thing that I uh, wanted to talk to you about, or actually, you even approached me about this one, is to clarify your views on the Marxist understanding of value itself highly contested um and because i already know in the comments we're probably going to hear like well you aren't critiquing my form of value theory blah 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 um and, and you and you say something so i want so part of the reason i asked to come on was i, I was watching some recent stuff you posted about mmt and you were saying well it's this value theory and not the other value theory so there's 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 several different value theories and that's part of what i want to talk about yeah um I I think you may have convinced me there might be several different value theories in Marx that Marx himself is not a rela is not particularly aware aren't the same or if he is he's not articulating it very clearly. Um, so let's uh, you know let's talk about your your studies here. You, you started diving into Marx again. Um, and really digging into his sourcing on Smith, Ricardo, and then people like William Pettis and the stuff that comes up in like uh, theories of Petty. surplus Petty. value. Petty. Pettis, Pettis is the trade wars guy. This is yeah. Petty. Petty. <laughs> <laughs> William Petty. Um, is um, and you've been pointing out that like basically Marx makes Petty too complicated. Um, and in thus in doing so actually misses under, misunderstands a lot of like basic stuff and what, and what early economics was doing. You've also talked about this in, in, uh, terms of Malthus, um, uh, which, which was not you vindicating like Malthus view on population. You weren't doing that, but that Malth Malthus's views on economics, which are under discussed, um, are not as, unevolved or even as tied into his views on population as they are generally presented. Um, so what got you interested in this and what, you know, what did you start to read? Because I, I do know that this is part of your critique, not just of Marxism, but of economics as a whole. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is, this is what I've been working on for the last, God, I don't know, it's probably been five or six months now since I got you know, sometimes you just get in a, and I think we talked about this briefly the last time I was on your show, but I've been, I've been plugging away at it since then. Sometimes you just get in an argument and you got to spend six months researching stuff to win the argument. And that's kind of what I've been, been doing, you know, gotten to an argument about Marx, um, which is, which is a, you know, Marx's economics is not something that I've spent a lot of time with in the last five or six years. You know, I, I read that stuff. I came to a conclusion about it. The conclusion made me want to read some other things. And so I've, I've been away from it. But my, you know, my interest, I've been returning to this whole set of problems for a few reasons. One is at the member school, Jared Baxter, who I think you had on recently or are going to have on. Um, I'm going to have on in, uh, in the fall. Yeah. Right. Um, is, is given a, a series of courses for us on Marx. We began with the early Marx uh, last year. And so that kind of got me just reading that material, which I, I was reticent to, to read it. That's why Jared's doing Marx for the member school and I'm, I'm not doing it. Um, because I have such a love-hate relationship with it, but so I was re I was reticent to get back into it. But as as happens with Marx, once you start getting into it, you get sucked into it again. 
Um, and, 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 but also, you know, because I am going to be turning my dissertation into a book. And so I've been thinking, you know, I want the, the book's going to be a little different. I'm going to remove a lot of stuff and, and add something. And, and one thing that I want to add is basically um, a bridge between in, in chapter one of the dissertation, which is about Marx, and chapter two, where I then move back to, to James Stewart and the, the late 16th, early 17th century and kind of the emergence of the English deficit state. And that's kind of a big jump. And, and in the dissertation, I hand wave it by saying, and, and now we'll talk about William Shakespeare, et cetera, and so forth. But I, but I want to I wanna find more of a bridge. And, and interestingly, that bridge leads to Hobbes, who, of course, is a figure I think we talked a little bit about last time. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching Leviathan right now, um, a figure that I, I have some fondness for. Um, but it's interesting because Hobbes really is, in some ways, the originator of the value theory. Um, but but what he means, what what he introduces, is a different concept of what it ends up becoming. So there's a whole history, uh, beginning with some just kind of uh, brief remarks by Hobbes um, about what would eventually become value that are taken up by his secretary William Petty, um, who's a very interesting figure who I think is not talked about enough. Um, among people who are interested in the intellectual history of economics, so I've been so I've been tracing that concept, uh, the value concept, kind of beginning with Hobbes into William Petty, and then and then later economic um, uh, thinkers, in the hopes of basically being able to, you know, once I've done showing what I try to show in that chapter, which is that liquidity, that the price of liquidity, is this repressed concept in Marx. He, he really um, is anxious about it, wants it to go away, assumes that it isn't there. This is a problem for the way that he presents the structure of, of, a, of a monetized economy. And the, the question that I don't answer in the dissertation that I hope to answer in the book is where did, why, where did Marx get this concept? Where did this concept come from? Why is it important? Why are we attached to it? Why are we arguing over it? Because I, I feel that a lot of people don't know this. I mean, they, you, you, undertake to defend it because you're a partisan of Marxism against some other kind of economic theory and you want to defend the value theory because we there's this idea you know that the stakes of Marxism as a kind of science of economics depends in some way on this value theory you have you have other people who want to save Marx and and and, and don't want to defend the value theory and so they produce these readings of capital that that basically make the economics arguments in the book irrelevant. I mean, this is the William Clare Roberts move was really the whole argument of Marx's capital is uh, in three footnotes to Dante and the, the bulk of the text about the linen and the Bibles and all that stuff is irrelevant. I mean, he didn't really, I mean, that's basically what they say. So, so I, you know, so people are arguing over this thing, but I don't think they really have a great idea of, of where it came from. So I've been trying to trace that history and it begins in the 17th century William Petty and Richard Cantillon, who, who is responding to Petty. And, and they are two thinkers. So I'm going to talk about, I want to, I want to, I'm going to try to explain this to you as we go forward, um, who develop uh, what's kind of the, the foundations of what ends up becoming the value theory. But they have two different versions of it. And later value theories are trying to synthesize the two different theories and also add some additional complications. And in particular, it's complicated by the introduction of the concept of economic growth into economic thought, which is later. They start talking about growth in the kind of mid to late 18th centuries. Interestingly, it might be David Hume, who's kind of the guy who introduces this um, concept into the literature. And later on, you get this stuff about growth. This leads to a huge, it's really, it becomes really confusing. But it's built on the foundations of this earlier theory, or, or I call it a problem space in this essay that I'm working on. It's not a theory, it's a problem space. Um, where, where Petty and Cantillon, neither of them is thinking about the growth of the economy, um, whatever that means. And so I th it's easier to see the problems that they're working with in that literature. So I've been, I've been trying to work through that. And, and partly I wanted to talk to you today for selfish reasons, because I'm a little stuck at the end of it. And I'm hoping that trying to explain it to you will uh, get it unstuck in my mind. Because I'm now, I'm now to Ricardo, who's the last step before Marx. And it's um, and he has this whole debate with Malthus, right? So so um, which is an interesting debate, and I think not well understood because a big part of what they're actually debating about is the national debt. So essentially, they're writing in the in the wake of the defeat of Napoleon, and the English are trying to figure out what to do with the national debt because they've suspended convertibility to gold, 
So they have this big floating debt. Uh, gold is um, trading above the mint price, basically. So the official value of the currency in terms of gold is uh, too high. The market is valuing it much lower. And, and they're trying to decide whether they're going to wind down the debt or not. And part of what Ricardo and Malthus are arguing about is whether if they paid off the debt, would that lead to a reduction of demand in the economy? So it's a so it's a question about whether it's a question that's very much related to these modern MMT debates about what is public debt? Is it money itself? Does it you know, what does it do? Um, well, they you know, Malthus and Ricardo were, were having an argument about about that, among other things. And so what I am trying to foreground in this work and what I want to try to walk you through today is I think it's important to understand that value concepts <clears throat> are developed out of debates among the largely English, partly French ruling class in the 17th, 18th centuries about tax policy. So the value theories are conservation laws proposed in economics as a way to underpin an argument about taxation, about the limits of taxation, about the effects of taxation, other things like this. What's weird is that this drops out in Marx because Marx is not very interested in taxation. Um, he is sort of imagining a pure liberal economy with no state in it, um, among, among other things. And so I... And so it's, it seems to me that when people, when people try to take value theories as the basis for a science of economics, they're abstracting it away from the political context that produced these concepts. And I think it would help us to try to remember, to try to note, try to, to trace that history and to reintegrate, right, the fact that value theories are always implicitly making arguments about the state and its taxation. And its policies and stuff like that um and so i think it's helpful to try to reconnect that so so well, I will, there's I have yeah. a whole course about petty and continuum that i'll launch into but i'll, I'll let you get it no into. i mean there's a lot there um one of the things that that you did help me see when we talked about theories of surplus value is when marx is running about petty yeah um that he does miss the tax contact entirely. So like this whole this whole discussion, which as a as a sub note is such a specific part of value theory that often Marxists just don't discuss it at all. They're not talking about the stuff in theories of surplus value. And I guess part of volume one of capital. Um, but even though even the value people, be they value form theorists, econophysist value theorists, you know, um, and I think it does tell you the problem of how many supposed answers there are to what Marx believes is value theory uh, in a way that's, that's not true in other economic cases, because it's not like there's, you know, I'm not a believer in like marginalist economics, but we do kind of all know what it is. Like, there's not a debate about what the original thinkers <laughs> or marginalism think it was. Right. right? Um so, and, uh, and also that, you know, the dominant tradition uh, in Marx until recently, you know, this was super important to the 1950s and the 1960s to like basically 2012, no one talked about value theory. If you talk to Marxists, they're like, oh, well, we don't believe in that. Marx was wrong in that transformation. We've been trying to pick up the project. Otherwise, David Harvey does this. But when they try to read Capital, I'm, I'll be frank, I, I actually don't understand what they're doing because a lot of the times I'm like, you're not making sense of the, like, the categories that you're using don't make sense with the text you're pulling it from, right? And so I got into looking at this. But even I started being like, I don't know that I know anyone who can explain to me what exactly Marx means by this, right? So I started digging into theories of surplus value to get back to this. And there's a whole discussion of what is productive and unproductive to the general surplus. But the general yes. surplus is like this, this nebulous aggregate of all economic transaction in a given economy. Yes. I mean, um, yes. So, so this is what's more clear if we set Marx aside for a moment and mm -hmm. go to the stuff that he's referencing. Because okay. he's, I mean, okay, so, I mean, just to, 
you mentioned earlier, is he confused? Is he what what's the deal with these different theories? There's a there's a there's a there's a very generous reading and there's a less generous reading. I mean, and I'll and I'll try to return to this at the end. There's definitely confusion and in some ways some deliberate hand waving in the materials that Marx is picking up, especially starting from so Smith and then Ricardo and Malthus as being these two people who are having a debate over the Smithian paradigm in the kind of next generation. Smith, and I well, I think we can come back to this. I mean Smith sometimes surreptitiously switches measures when he needs to in order to make his arguments work out. So he so he sometimes switches to a corn measure when the labor measure doesn't work for him and these kinds of things. So there is some confusion, and, and, and unless you read really carefully, you won't notice there's big, um, big, big debates in the scholarly literature about this where people are very mad at each other about exactly what it is that Smith is doing. So it is confusing, and it's and especially when you get to Ricardo. I mean, that stuff is really difficult to wrap your, to figure out what's going on. Um, and not only because Ricardo changes his views sometimes because he's like trying to respond to Malthus and this other kind of stuff. But so, it, so I mean, the, the generous reading of Marx, and I think this is going on at a certain level, is that he's trying to do dialectics with this value concept. So he knows there's contradictory concepts. And because he's you know, kind of this earnest German schoolboy who says, aha, I have the tools to make contradictions into a powerful thing that moves forward, right? So I'm going to do Hegel to it. And and I think you basically because there, so two of the labor cons, the labor value concepts are what they call in the literature, the labor embodied theory and the labor commanded theory. And they're, mm -hmm. and they're different, right? So, so, um, you know, so one is the idea that's, that's one is the substance idea. You know, the idea when so when Marx talks about crystallized val crystallized social substance and stuff like that, that's kind of this embodied value substance theory. The other theory, which is the first theory, this is Hobbes and Petty's theory, is the labor commanded theory, which just says the value of money is how much laborers you can hire. Basically, they're just arguing that the that the nominal wage is the deflator. For, for monetary quantities. So if you want to know the real value of a quantity of money, just ask how many units of labor it will buy, and that's the real measure, right? That's the value commanded measure. So these things are in tension with one another, right? And and the tension is the tension between price and cost price and Marx, because basically, you know, the fact that there's relative surplus value that one firm, because of its capital, can produce a good at a lower cost than the generally average cost necessary to produce the good. That is the tension between the two concepts. And so I think there's a generous reading. And I think, I actually think this is true to an extent. I think, I think Marx is sometimes confused, but I actually think he's trying to do something clever with this, which is basically to say, look, these two value concepts are the first two terms of a Hegelian triad because you've got the labor embodied concept, which is value in itself. And you've got the labor com commanded value, which is value for another, right? How much, how much labor is there in the thing versus how much labor is recognized as being the value of the thing, right? So you've got the externalization demand for recognition. And Marx is saying, well, look, I can turn this into a Hegelian dialectic and I'm gonna produce a, a you know, uh, I'm going to produce a synthesis that's going to that's going to be the next term. So, so I think he is trying to do this, and I think he has some awareness of this. Now, the problem is that if you go look at what Marx says about William Petty in theories of surplus value, which is one of, one of the first things that I did when I was doing this, I think I think that Marx himself is is the person who's responsible for a major misreading of William Petty's text, um, which I'll tell you about in a second after you've had a chance to say something. No, I. Uh, I, I'm thinking about this and I'm like, well, the labor commanded versus like th this debate makes a lot of sense to me. Also the way that Smith as, uh, and later Ricardo uh, move what they're counting um, stores in. I was just thinking about this. Oh, all of a sudden the physiocrat versus pure Marxist monetary uh, people who would think you, you can measure it in monetary value versus the transformation problem versus the TSSI. Yeah. This all actually goes back to this and it's not even like, that's not in Marx, but the petty is like, that's that, that's where you found the first misreading 
that you, yes. you think is there is so, it, is Marx's number is like is of of the of all the things this one's the one that actually is too generous to Marx. Yeah, no, I think this is Marx's mistake, and I think that um, his, but I think that his mistake has colored the reception of Petty by non-Marxists' uh, his history of economics. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, Marx. I think this is little appreciated, but theories of surplus value is like a major, one of the first major like histories of economic thought. So Marx actually um, more more than, in addition to just being a political economist, he's pretty influential just on the, the history of what it is. So like when people talk about classical political economy, that's a term Marx invented. Um, uh, there, nobody thought there was that before Marx said that there was. Um, and, but anyway, but, but Marx goes looking in William Petty for the seeds of his own position, which is of the, this labor theory of value concept. And so what you'll find, so there's a book by Tony Asper Morgos called something about political, I, I don't know, you can message me on Twitter and I'll tell you what the title of it is, Tony Asper Morgos. It's, it's a really helpful book on some of this stuff, um, this history of political thought, but, but, but he is confused about this too. I mean, what you'll get in Asper Morgos or other commentators is Pet well, Petty was trying to create the labor theory of value, but he was confused and like his example doesn't make sense and and, and you know, et cetera and so forth. But because and, and the issue here is that they can't make Petty's numbers work. He gives a numerical example. And if you try to read this example as being labor theory of value, it's nonsense. What I but there's another way we can read it in which it makes sense. So basically, what Petty says is he says. Okay, so imagine that, uh, you know, there's a farm, right? So Petty wants to know about the value of an asset relative to the value of the products of that asset. So you've got a farm, and every year the farm throws off a stream of corn. What's the relationship between those things, right? This is capital, capital asset pricing. Um, and Petty begins by saying, well, basically, he arbitrarily... Um, introduces a time horizon of 21 years, um, which he's, he seems to think is like an empirical fact that the basically the value of the farm is, a, is worth about 21 years worth of the rent of the farm. This seems to be a sort of empirical observation. He has a story about this, which basically says, so Petty is interested in actuarial tables. So he's one of these early people who's interested in calculating mortality, statistics about mortality. And he kind of has this argument that, um, well, 21 years is the maximum length of time that a son, father, and grandfather are all alive at the same time. Um, and somehow this is an explanation for why the, it doesn't, he doesn't really, it doesn't really make sense. And that, like that part doesn't think of, does it? So it seems like Petty is observing this. He's saying, the value of a farm is about 21 years worth of rent. And then he comes up with a story to explain it based on this actuarial data. That seems to be kind of what's going on. So you'll find people criticizing him later for not having a theory of this. Like, why should it be like this? But he doesn't really have one. But, but his purpose in saying this is he wants to ask a question, which is basically, how do we understand the capitalized value of a non-farm income stream? So he, so he says, look, you got a farm, there's, there's uh, you know, you've got an asset, it throws off a revenue source, um, but it's denominated in corn. So you've got, so you, you know, so you've got a certain amount of corn profits coming off of the farm. Now, how does that relate to uh, money, right? How do we, how do we measure that value in terms of money? Because one of the things that all of these thinkers are really concerned with is the fact that the, that the, that there's an unstable relationship between the value of money and the value of corn, um, uh, because there's you know the, there's been a price revolution over the last hundred years, and they've all noticed this. Prices change, so so they're they're like okay, so we need a real measure, right? Contrast this to the 19th century, and we've made this point before together that in the 19th century the, the gold index was a fairly stable um, relative to real mm -hmm. prices, right? So these earlier writers, not the case. They're very aware. That the, that the relationship between gold and or between money and and corn changes. So so Petty says, okay, so how do we how do we commensurate basically corn profits denominated in corn from something else from money profits denominated in money? And so Petty kind of imagines. Suppose you have the opportunity to invest. Um, well, so he doesn't say this. What he says is, suppose a man could get 
by his labor, sort of. So that's why people think it's a labor concept, because he kind of invokes the idea of labor. But he imagines, say you just go to Peru and you dig silver out of the ground. He, he then forwards the argument that says, well, the amount of profit you could get from farming would have to be equal to the amount of silver that you should, you could dig out of the ground. Um, and he assumes away uh, the wages. So he assumes away what we would call labor, which is the wages you pay to the, to the, to the worker. He says, well, just imagine that this guy who's going to Peru just kind of like digs potatoes, wild potatoes out of the ground or whatever he feeds himself. And, and so it's assumed that away. He says, well, the, the amount would have to be equal. So the amount of silver that comes from one year of going to Peru would have to be equal in value to the amount of corn uh, produced by one year of the farm. Now, this doesn't make any sense if you think that it's a labor theory of value. Why? Well, because the asset has a price. If you could get an equal amount of silver by going to Peru and digging it out of the ground and coming back to England, for free, for no purchasing of an asset, then there'd be no reason to buy the farm in the first place. So the fact that the farm has an asset value um, depends upon the fact that you know that that you don't have this other opportunity to go to go get the same same profit without buying an asset. Right? This is a puzzle that arises in Petty's example when you try to read mm -hmm. it through this labor theory of value, and that's why everybody dismisses it. Um, and I, this is in his, uh, it's called a treatise on taxes. It's a little hard to find, but again, if you message me, I can send you the text. Now, okay. but so what, but what's going on here? Well, Petty's example makes sense if you realize that what he calls labor is what we would call profit. I mean, sorry, what we would call capital. That is, he, he's, so when he's talking about labor, he means an investor. He says his argument makes sense if you, if you, if you realize that what he's saying he's making this equalizing rate of return on capital argument. So that so he's saying the, the rate of profit available to be invested, to, to be harvested by investing in overseas trade has to be equal to the rate of profit um, available to be, to be received by investing in a farm at home. So he's making an equalizing rate of profits argument. That's half of what becomes this, this transformation problem, right? Basically the transformation problem is the difficulty of reconciling a labor embodied theory with the equalizing rate of capital uh, theory. Marx doesn't realize that William Petty already has the equalizing rate of capital theory. That's his original argument because mm. he's making that argument for, for reasons related to English tax debates after the restoration of the Stuarts and the end of the civil war. So, so basically, um, you know, the, the, the question for them was, well, um, how should we proportion taxes uh, between these two sectors, between urban property and rural property? Because those are the two major classes of taxpayers. And, and the way that their system was working out, the taxes were falling, falling disproportionately heavily on, uh, on land, on, on, the, on the farms. Um, pretty much everybody's agreed about this. And during the Civil War, basically the... The, the city of London managed to push basically all the taxes on. They, they got rid of taxes for themselves, for the, for the commercial entities. William Petty, in forwarding this argument about the, the, the necessary equalization of the real rate of return on capital, which is his real theory, not the labor theory of value, he's saying this because he is a landholder in Ireland. So he's got a bunch of land on the periphery of the London logistics network. He's got peripheral farms. And his argument mm -hmm. is, is to, to go to the London commercial classes, right? And say, look, you Londoners have money, you've got silver, and what do you do with it? You send it overseas and invest it in the slave trade, for instance. This is one of the, the the thing the English are getting into the slave trade in a serious way in exactly the time that these writings are being formulated. Um, you have this money, you invest it overseas, uh, and what do you get? You get more money. Petty says, okay, but look, what do you want to do with that money? You London merchant, you've got money, you invest it overseas to get more money. Getting more money can't be the point. I mean, what do you want? 
And his answer is, you want servants. You want servants in London. So mm -hmm. the real, what's the real value of these monetary returns that you're getting by investing in overseas trade? Well, the, the real value of it is how many butlers you can have. And what determines how many butlers you can have? The price of corn in London. And so basically what he's saying is that competing with one another, you merchant class to get money from overseas, you're just going to be bidding up the price of labor. You're, you're playing a zero sum game with one another. So you don't have a coherent class interest, says Petty, to just get monetary profits because the value of those monetary profits has to be denominated in the servants that you can hire. And so when you shift taxes onto the agricultural classes, what are you doing? Well, you are making it unprofitable to invest in a marginal farm because, because the rate of return on your money that you could get elsewhere is higher, right? So, so if, if you're an investor, what do you want to do? Do you want to buy a farm in Ireland or do you want to invest overseas? Well, if land is being taxed, then you're not going to want to invest in the in the marginal farm because it costs more to bring the corn from Ireland to London. So there's this diminishing returns as you get further from the core. And and so yeah, so so basically so 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 because the rate of capitalization tends to equalize, um, you're you are actually discouraging the kind of investments, investment in marginal farms that will allow you as a class to get what you want. And instead, by you pursuing what looks like your class interest to push taxes onto the other faction of society, you're actually undermining what you should really want, right? That, I hope that kind of makes sense. So, so he is introducing this equalization of the rates of capital argument, which he describes as labor, although he's really talking about capital. Because what he means by labor is just urban taxpayers as opposed to rural taxpayers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he, it, so, so he doesn't have this. He has this kind of Lockean rhetoric, right, about how labor is the fundamental basis of property. But remember when Locke says this, he includes his servant, right? He says the, the, the what is it, the peat my servant has digged or whatever it is, right? So Locke is imagining that labor when he says labor is the foundation of property he also means labor that you hire so when petty talks about labor he just means urban uh, uh, uh taxpayers and and he's inter he wants to introduce this capitalization rate of capitalization equalization of profits argument in order to try to argue against shifting all the taxes onto the agricultural base um to an audience of urban um, commercial investors to, to, to try to convince them that this is in their best interest. Um, and so what is interesting to me about this is, is that the problem here is a question of how to distinguish between positional goods and absolute goods. How to mm -hmm. distinguish between a good that whose value is relative to its distribution, right? Money is only good if I have more of it than other people. So, so at one time, Petty um, ha has a thought experiment. He, he commits a kind of fallacy of composition where he says, how do we measure the real value of the, all the money in England? Well, we take all the, suppose you took all the money and divided it equally among everybody. How much, how many servants would each person be able to hire? Well, if everybody has the same amount of money, then nobody would be able to hire any servants because nobody would need to work to be a servant. So, so there's this interesting problem, right? Where money is only really valuable because I have more of it than somebody else. And what Petty tries to do, and this is the foundation for the whole discourse that becomes economics, is to explain what is the absolute good that is sort of obscured by the positional good on the surface of money and prices. Um, and part of what I want to argue by, you know, through tracing this whole series of history, I mean, it, um, which gets a little complex, but it seems to me that economics was never able to resolve this controversy. So, I mean, this question, how do we distinguish between relative goods, positional goods, and absolute goods um, is a question that's never resolved. Uh, it is the, the sort of last gasp of this controversy was the Cambridge capital controversy, at which point they swept it under the rug and, and kind of forgot about it. 
but it's it's much easier when we go back to figures like Petty and, and Comtiom, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, to see what they were arguing about because it's it's much it's much more clear. And I think it helps bring these later problems into focus. So I want to talk about Contion and, and Malthus a little bit before we get to how this is relevant to um, economics debates today, because um, people who know you online have been are probably, you know, are probably kind of interested in why you think this still matters in debates between, say, Marxist or modern monetary theorist or hybridist. Are, are the Marxists who are, who are fundamentally uninterested in what Marx spent the majority of his time writing about, which, um, which is actually a great deal of Marxist. It's a, William Clare Roberts is one form of it. Um, a lot of socialist Republican, uh, Republicanism, I don't mean, I mean, smaller Republicanism, like the Neo Kowskites, yeah. they also I'm seem to not care. Yeah. Yeah. They also seem to not care about what Marx actually has to say about economics, which is, which is strange to me. They're always downplaying it. Um, often because I think, as a side note, and I know some of these people, I think because the debates around this and Marxism are immediately divisive, so they just would rather just make it go away. Right. Um, but how did the French play into this? Let's go. To, let's go back to that part of this yeah. history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the next move is is. Richard Cantillon. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's in a bit of historical irony that it's almost like too on the nose, right? So, so as you, so uh, you, y'all may know, so, so as I said before, so Petty is an investor in um, Irish land. More than an investor, uh, he's the guy who surveyed Ireland after it was conquered during the Civil War. So, I mean, basically what happened is that the new model army um, wasn't getting paid and they were going to become a political threat. And so Cromwell is like, well, why don't y'all go conquer Ireland and we'll give you Ireland um, instead of getting paid. So he kind of packs them off to Ireland um, to, just to deal with them. They end up conquering it. And then they have the problem of what to do with the land. And um, uh, the, basically it was going to take 10 years to just to survey um, what they had taken. Uh, William Petty kind of wins this bid. He says, I'll do it in a year. And he basically he basically transforms surveying into a low skill um, thing. So you don't have to train the surveyors. He, he, he broke it down into a system so you could um, hire uh, uh, untrained labor in order to do it. And he did it in a year. And then he made a great fortune speculating on the value <laughs> of the shares, right? So he's the guy in charge of... So, so they're issuing all this paper that's backed by the Irish land. And the paper uh, is is there's dealers you can it's bought and sold in secondary markets and um, so and so nobody really knows what it's worth because they don't know how much it's backed by so Penny's the guy who's in charge of of finding out what it's worth and he's also speculating on it which um, led to a bunch of lawsuits that he spent like most of the rest of his life uh, engaged in dealing with but the the irony that I is that Richard Cantillon is one of the people whose family's land was dispossessed um, by the by the new model army um, so some of the land that Petty himself ended up owning was once owned by Richard Cantillon so there's a bit of a personal animosity there and and so what's interesting is that Cantillon um, closes Petty's system so Petty in his model kind of assumes that there's new land at the margin available to be in invested in. He assumes that there's this unoccupied land. Cantillon, uh, whose family, right, this supposedly unoccupied land was taken from, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't have this principle. He says, no, no, it's a closed system. There's no more land to get. Um, and so beginning there, uh, Cantillon seeks to develop a theory that will explain essentially uh, what the French state should be aiming for in terms of its trade policy. So, so I want to note that basically economics, in order to be economics, begins by a saying that money can't be what you want, right? That mo it, money itself can't be what you want. You've got, it's got to be the case that you want something else beside money. What is it? And and the reason that they're saying this, in contrast to the earlier thinkers that they call mercantilists, I think mercantilism is 
a retro projection. I don't. Th I think it's an epithet, um, not a just real a real description of a of a real coherent set of of beliefs. But you know, but in general, like when people are writing economic policy for the state. Um, prior to the to the invention of economics, they generally assume that the state needs more money in it. You know that there that there's not enough money in the in the state that it would be good if the country got more money. The the economists say no 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 money is not what you want. Um, and in fact, just getting more money might even be bad. Right? It might be bad to have a surplus of money for various reasons. And Kantian is very interested in this kind of thing. But but the reason that they're thinking this is that they've just watched. The Dutch beat the Spanish. I mean, that like that is the basis for the development of this discourse because Spain's the one with all the money. Look, you know, the Spanish king has all this money, and the Dutch don't have money. They got debt instead, right? They got this public debt, and and they they won. So how can it be that this little this little state with no land in it? Uh, how could they beat the Spanish Empire? That's something that thinkers in this period are very interested. And so, the, and so they begin with the recognition of what you might hear referred to as the Spanish disease or, you know, the, the idea basically that if you just shove a bunch of money into a country, then it's, it's going to like create decadence. You know, I mean, the rich people will get it. They'll just hire servants. They'll bid up the price of labor. Um, their, their industry will become uncompetitive. They'll spend it all on imports and et cetera. So Cantillon has this kind of cyclical theory according to which you know countries have a have a period of a golden age and then they get a bunch of money and then the money makes them decadent and they become weak and there's kind of this cycle and so mm -hmm. and so the question is if if money itself isn't what you should want then what should you want that's that's a more difficult question to answer uh, than you might think right i mean i mean what should you want in cantillon's theory basically is and you you can imagine that he's you know he's framing this rhetorically to appeal to a kind of territorially minded uh, uh, French ruling class that still imagines itself as a kind of feudal aristocracy or whatever. Cantillon's argument is basically say, to say, look, um, Eve, assume right that two countries have a have in monetary terms an even trade relationship. So, you know, they trade with each other, but the value of the goods balances out such that no money actually, um, you know, they do it all with bills of exchange and, and no money actually moves between the countries. Um, so even if there's monetary value parity between two countries, Cantillon says, one country might still be winning. How? Well, you'd be winning if the stuff that you export to pay for the stuff that you import takes less land to produce. So he is a he is theorizing what we map what we might now call the world system or the the value added hierarchy right he's he's saying look there's a core and there's a periphery and core countries export manufacturers and they import uh corn they import agricultural goods peripheral countries export agricultural goods they import uh manufactured goods the manufactured goods take if you if you calculate their value in terms of land if you use an acre as your measure of value and say how much land does everything take, then then basically you can kind of you can conquer other countries through trade by you essentially incorporate their territory into your virtual territory by giving them less of your territory in trade than you get of their territory, right? That's basically his argument, and and so you can it's sort of the other side of the the English Corn Law debates where eventually mm -hmm. the, the English sort of decide, hey, it, and this is relevant to this Malthus and Ricardo, they decide, hey, why don't we give up on being energy independent? Why don't we give up on being, uh, uh, have growing all of our own food because we'll import the food and we'll export manufactured goods and, and we'll, we'll develop in that way. So Cantillon, I think, is trying to get the French government to see that this is, about to happen to them and that they need to try to become the core rather than the periphery because because France is exporting a lot of wine and corn and agricultural products and stuff like this. So so that's Cantillon's theory. And that is really the basis. Cantillon is the one who introduces the substance theory. So Cantillon introduces this value substance theory. His substance is not labor. Um, he thinks he thinks corn or land is the fundamental denominator of value. But that's where the uh, embodied value thing comes from. And so I think that m much of the rest of the history of economics 
and in a, in a trajectory that kind of culminates with Marx can be read as a tension between these two ideas. There's this English value, or sorry, labor commanded theory, and there's this mm-hmm. French corn embodied theory, and they're in contradiction with one another. And the, but but both of them agree that money can't be what you really want, that money can't be what really matters. And so they explain money away. They show you what's going on underneath money. And in in certain ways that end up being very problematic. And I think I think really the foundations of what Marxists Marxists call the transformation problem is there already in in this sort of uh, dialogue between Petty and Kantian. And so I think it's it's useful to, to return to them because they 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 present these problems in a way that is is much more direct and is less obscured in in the sort of uh, jar, accumulation of jargon that that you get after like 150 more years of people arguing about about value. Right. So we, you know we don't have to deal with fixed capital versus variable capital, which is you know a socially necessary labor time versus uh, uh, labor commanded, um, which makes variable capital and all this. Uh, you know, your argument is like, well, you know, these things explain some things, but they don't actually fix the the fundamental problem that we're still seeing here. Correct? That's yeah. your basic assertion. Well, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, now we got to talk about Adam Smith because, so, <laughs> so neither Comtion nor Petty are interested very much in the accumulation of fixed capital assets. So. Mm-hmm. So I'm so I've been arguing that Petty is a theorist of capital in the sense of capitalized value. He's interested in the question of what's the present value of, of discounted future income streams, that kind of question. And he's interested in that because it matters for English tax policy. Mm-hmm. Um, but they aren't as interested in capital in the sense of machines that that fixed capital assets that allow you to, you know, produce things more efficiently in terms of labor inputs, et cetera, and so forth, right? This is a concern that comes later. And um, it's something, you know, so so one more of the value concepts, there's kind of this third, this is the whole, this is the Holy Ghost of the value trinity, which is the relative prices of different commodities, mm-hmm. um, which is, which is something that people like Stuart and Mill are kind of trying to develop this theory of later. In a way, I think that's a red herring. That's part of what I kind of want to suggest is that that is really not, that is just an, there's an original question of a manufacturing or a, a commercial sector and an agricultural sector. And mm-hmm. then and then you can kind of say, okay, within the commercial sector, we're going to make every good into its own sector, and we're going to like repeat the analysis. But it's just repeating this original question, good by good. And so I, I feel like it complicates things unnecessarily. Um, but but that is a thing that they're that 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 the the, the pre Smith, I guess, thinkers are trying to think through. But the so again, so okay, so with the later thinkers after Hume, there's this idea of growth, uh, and of course there's Adam Smith. Um, I think it is useful again to read Adam Smith in terms of not what his theory unfolds as a kind of theoretical structure based on these axioms like labor is the source of all value or whatever, but how is he attempting to intervene into a political a, 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 a policy debate? Uh, uh, in virtue of these concepts, right? These these concepts are allowing him to do something. And this is where, well, the productive versus unproductive labor distinction comes in for Smith. So it's it's his argument, um, although we see it already in Kantian, it plays a role in Kantian's, um, as I said before, his, his cyclical theory of the rise and fall of commercial nations um, involves this um, productive, unproductive labor distinction the distinction basically is that landlords hire unproductive labor and capitalists hire productive labor. So if it's hired by a capitalist, then it's productive. And if it's hired by a landlord, then basically you're imagining that it's just your butler or something. You know, you're just paying somebody to kind of hang out and 
fan you with the bamboo leaves or whatever, and that's unproductive labor. So this this plays a role in that theory. But for Smith, importantly, it includes not just the landlords, but every government employee. So mm -hmm. the unproductive versus productive uh, labor distinction in Smith is just the public-private sector distinction. That's it. Now, that's a bit of a problem. Um, there's all kinds of problems with this. If you think that um, the point is to explain something, you know, productive, you know, well, I think, we, you know, do the, does the Starbucks barista produce value or not or something like this, right? I mean, that is taking this whole schema to a totally absurd uh, place. But in, in Smith, the point is just that that's the government. And why does this matter? It's because Smith kind of uh, in book five, which I recommend is the place to begin reading Wealth of Nations, um, Smith begins with the observation that richer nations uh, have military dominance over poorer nations, um, which is a reversal of sort of this idea you might have that like uh, rich nations become decadent and then fall to the you know austere deserts Islam nomads or whatever, like you might have in Ibn Khaldun. Um, he, you know, Smith has the idea, well, rich nations uh, uh, dominate militarily, poor nations. And so and so you need to become rich. Why should the government care about society, about the wealth of nations? Well, because it's a, it's a security risk. You need to be richer or else you'll be dominated by other rich countries. And so there's mm -hmm. a trade-off, which is that you can hire a bigger army um, to march around and like practice their drills, um, or you could hire fewer workers, in which case they'd be available for the private sector for for uh, labor. And so, basically, Smith's argument is that there's sort of this process that happens naturally in the private sector um, that produces wealth, and this wealth makes you militarily stronger. And this is something that the private sector can do and the state can't do. So Smith sort of assumes, he basically says, well, the state could try to do what the public, what, what, the, what, the, what the private sector does and like, you know, invest in factories and, and stuff, um, but it, it's less efficient. Um, basically, mm -hmm. Smith just has a kind of uh, principal agent problem. That's his whole, his whole argument is that in the, in the private sector, the principal is the agent. And when you introduce the public sector, then he is no longer. And so they're less efficient. And, and so basically, you know, whenever the state is taxing in order to fund, uh, fund the army, it's sort of sucking energy out of this process that would otherwise be occurring that is going to make it more militarily powerful later, right? So there's kind of this short-term security, long-term security trade-off that Smith in imposes uh, by means of this capital theory, um, you know, basically as an argument for, you know, why the state uh, should should tax as little, you know, it has, it's got to tax enough to do the necessary functions and no more than that, because, because even if the state thinks that it's sacrificing, you know, uh, prosperity for security, really prosperity is security. It's just future security, right? Mm -hmm. So he's so he's saying whenever you're going to be, you know, uh, uh, he has this, you know, you're this, when the state taxes, it, it takes away capital that would otherwise be invested in the private sector. So he's got this conservation law. That's that's the point. There's a conservation law. The conservation law is introduced in order to make this argument about tax policy. Um, and in particular against uh, the debt. Smith is very much against the debt. Um, uh, and he said, you know, so he says, you know, even though taxing is bad, it's the, it's the least bad way to fund the state. And so everything that the state does should be taxes, never debt funded. Um, that's, that's this whole theory that he develops. Um, now, the issue is that, as, as we kind of said earlier, Smith is writing before the Napoleonic Wars, after the Napoleonic Wars, there is the debt, there's this huge permanent debt, and there's the question of what to do with it. So this Ricardo Malthus debate is a debate kind of internal to the Adam Smith paradigm. They both take themselves to be followers of Adam Smith, but they're trying to figure out what to do now that Smith's original uh, you know, project, like don't let the debt get too big, like that road's already passed. 
So the question is, you know, what what do we do now? And if we try to if we try to wind down the debt, is it going to crash the economy? And and Ricardo wants to argue no. Um, and part of how he argues that is appeals to versions of Say's law, the law of markets. Um, mm-hmm. uh, whereas Malthus is trying, Malthus, who's kind of representing the interests of the people who are getting paid out of the national debt, uh, the people who hold all this money, he's trying to argue, well, no, I mean, if you, if you, if you uh, wound down the national debt, then all of the country parsons wouldn't be buying stuff anymore and you'd have a crisis of effective demand. Uh, and then the and then the economy would 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 collapse. Um, so what's interesting is that Malthus really anticipates much of what we now think of as Keynesianism, um, mm-hmm. and and he also seems to have the better end of the argument. I mean, this seems right. You know, I mean, there's there Malthus is on the right side of divide between economic thinkers who see that money and debt, you know, there's this endogenous money problem. There's the question of, uh, you know, whether the economy would be stable if only the government didn't intervene and all this kind of stuff. Um, and Malthus just says no, basically. Now, that's it, what's curious to me, and this is what I'm stuck on. We've now arrived at the part that I'm stuck on, so I hope you can help me think through it, is that Marx, Marx needs... Ricardo to win in the Ricardo versus Malthus debate. He needs Malthus to to be wrong because he needs Ricardo's value theory so that he can then try to perform this Hegel trick on it to show how even if the government didn't intervene in the economy, it would still be unstable because its natural tendencies are... Uh, you know, contradictory, but mm-hmm. he needs to say that without taking the the Malthus path, which is to say, yeah, the economy has naturally contradictory tendencies, which is why we need the stimulation of effective demand by policy <laughs> of various kinds. So, so he needs basically he needs there to be this real fundamental value logic in the economy that is impervious to monetary effects, that that basically the economy would be the economy that it is no matter what monetary policy you choose, no matter whether you wind the debt down or not, no matter whether you do MMT or not. Like all of those things are causally irrelevant because there's this one logic of the economy and it's the real logic of the economy. So he, he needs that in order to do what he wants to do. The, the, the problem is... The problem is that the that it seems like the you know the proto Keynesian Malthus sort of already won the debate, which I think is part of why Marx hates Malthus so much, right? Because he doesn't. It seems like Marx doesn't really know how to respond to that in a convincing way, other than to try to kind of double down on this on this value theory that Ricardo has, um, where Ricardo is trying to, yeah, I mean, basically draw on uh, sort of perfect equilibrium, self-equilibrating markets kind of ideas in order to explain why the government should pay down, the, pay off the national debt and it could do so without hurting any, anybody. Um, in, in addition to the corn law stuff that is probably more familiar from, from the Ricardo Malthus debates. So that's, that's and, and it's out of that problem space, this set of problems, which is really, should the government have debt? What are the effects of, of government debt? What are the distributive consequences of of government taxation. What's the relationship between tax policy and growth? So the other thing they're arguing about is basically, you know, there's the Napoleonic Wars and England takes sterling off of gold and they print a bunch of banknotes and the economy takes off. Mm-hmm. I mean, so so Ricardo has to say, yeah, yeah, I know that the, like the economy is like growing a lot. We're having like a boom years over since we suspended uh, convertibility to gold, but it's not because of that. Right. There's it, it can't be because of the money. Right. The money can't be the reason money has to be an effect of what happens in the economy and never a cause of what happens in the economy. And he, he has to make this argument in order to try to advance the political argument that he has. And, and Marx's conceptual framework that he presents as though it's just, um, you know, a priori, almost scientific objective claims. These are claims that he gets from Ricardo, who's advancing them in order to 
in order to forward this specific political agenda. He's kind of a sound money guy, you know. Um, and so I just I think that I think that people who are drawn to Marx because of the the politics of it should be more aware of this intellectual history and and be weird be be wary of defending concepts out of allegiance to Marx um, when Marx himself is drawing on drawing these concepts from people whose politics we wouldn't feel the same attachment to, right? I mean, right. you like, like, can you imagine people, people saying like, well, we have to be loyal to the value theory because of Ricardo's politics, right? I mean, that, nobody would say that, but there isn't, there isn't that much of a difference, right? Marx's value theory basically is Ricardo's value theory. Um, that's where he's drawing it from. And so I, and so I, so I think that's interesting for that reason. But the deep, the deeper thing that I'm interested in is, is the positional versus absolute goods problem, and and the fact that val you need a value theory in mm -hmm. order to say, look, I'm going to quantify the economy for you in objective terms that involve no positionality, and I'm going to do this because it allows me to advance an argument about what tax policy should be that is objective rather than just being the interests of one faction or another in society. Um, and, and that's what value theories are advanced for. Now, Marx takes that on board as an assumption and this kind of reductio ad absurdum um, argument that he's constructing. But, it, but I think it, it's worth serious thought whether people who are politically invested in something called Marxism might be better served by just contesting the assumptions in the first place, rather, you know, by saying, by saying, look, I mean, there is no objective measurement of the economy that abstracts away from class, from positional antagonism in the economy. Basically, to say, to say, <clears throat> look, the the problem that things are worth more the more they're unevenly distributed is a fundamental problem of economics, and I think. I think we might be better served by trying to draw that problem out into the open and denying denying the conceptual well-foundedness of speaking objectively about value in order to show how value is politically constructed. There is no objective thing. It's, it's well, value is power. I mean, value is a discourse of power. I mean, here I sound like a Foucauldian, but, but this is, I think this is right. So, so, so this is what interests me in all of this, because I think that when you trace the history of the concept all the way back to Hobbes and Petty and the, their power theory of value, mm -hmm. um, you end up in, in what I think are more, are more potentially productive places that don't, that don't involve all of this technical debt to, um, to, to Ricardo and Smith that, that you would get um, if you want to defend Marxism as a science. And also don't quite get into the optimistic managerialism implied by mid to later Keynes, you know, like, um, uh, because I do think like, that's one of the things that's always turned me off about Keynes is there's all these predictions that he makes based off his, his assumptions of, of government influence and in money. Many of those things look to model out pretty well, at least within a singular nation. It gets a lot more complicated when you're dealing with multiple nations and foreign and forex currencies, etc. But, but then there are these these knock-on effects that he predicts, like the dropping of the workday, uh, what that don't happen, right? So, for me, the reason why I have been, I have been so reluctant to drop uh, the the labor theory of value was around those issues however if you see money as something that can never be neutral which is something that marx assumes um well interestingly marx both assumes that and tries to explain it away actually in capital i think that's that's a frustrating thing because money is a uh, in marx is is a fetish for a relation of production which is a power relationship ultimately um but that, you know, the, the, <laughs> but he also yeah. kind of assumes that it's neutral once it's once it's out in the world, like so, once it is. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. I so I think the I mean you know, Marx's theory right is that what is it that he says it's it's 
the, you know, the relation between people assumes the appearance of a relation between things. It's right. So, so it mm -hmm. seems like there's just this relation between things. One thing is worth X of another. And look, I mean, really what that is, is a, is a relation between people. It's, it's, it's that sort of thing. I, I think the response of the view that I'm kind of trying to articulate and develop here would be to say, look, I mean, Marxists are always telling me how things seem so that they can then pull the rabbit out of the hat and reveal to me that really it's some other way. But it, things don't even seem the way that Marxists say they seem, right? That's, that, I think, is, is the point, which is that if you look at prices, it doesn't appear like an objective quantitative relationship between things. It appears as a power struggle between buyers and sellers in, in the market and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff, right? It just seems like that. Um, and so I, I think that's a problem for Marx because they, because they want it, they need the power to be more hidden than it really is so that they can then reveal it to you because revealing the power that's hidden is the way that you're subjectivated as a Marxist, right? You, you say, I read Marx, I now see the power that's hidden, and I'm a Marxist. I, you know, I, the wool has been pulled from my eyes. I no longer see the world like I was a liberal. It's, that, it's this conversion thing. But I, but I think the power is actually much more obvious and right there on the surface. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't even seem that way in the first place. And, and so, the, I mean, the problem is where do, you go from, where do you go from there? Because, well, you've taken this, you've taken this promise of secret access to noumenal economic reality off the table. And, and you've said, look, I mean, it's just a, ba it's just a battlefield. There's, there's, yeah, there are just, there's just power. There's just prices. We already know that. But then the you know the value of having that revealed to you by critical theory is diminished, which I think is why they want to hang on to it so much. Hmm. I mean, I've always took it as also they don't want to grant that uh, that political contestation of a uh, of power within a currently existing state would be a viable means of doing this. Although Marxists have also and often. Uh, backed away from that view um like pretty consistently particularly as states are more powerful and insurrections seem harder and harder and further and further off for anyone to actually do um so yeah there's there's that uh, there's also this need to you know explain transitions in history which which supposedly labor theory of value enables you to do except <laughs> Except that's actually a problem in Marx, uh, to be quite frank, because if you read his description in um, Capital Volume 1, which it, which admittedly is a hypothetical, there's nothing about uh, that description that's actually limited to capital as it exists in, quote, capitalism. It's actually, you know, kind of supposed to endogenously come off of barter, which which we which anthropologically i have to give you know the, the grave rights and stuff they're due we know that that's not the origins of money and i'm and while i'm not sure from other things that marx writes that he necessarily thinks it is that's the dominant theory that you have in his work like um so what do you do with that because on one hand we're arguing that like the value form and abstract labor and blah 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 is it's specific to capitalism and on the other hand we're like yeah but anytime where there's markets this happens but 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 markets are not the primary thing that makes capitalism because there's pre you know there's pre-capitalist market you know societies and then all of a sudden you're in a real mess you're in a mess, um, <laughs> you're in a mess. and and the, and the reason that you're in this mess and this i think this gets at some really deep problems with our intellectual history that go beyond Marxism. We've touched on this before. I mean, this is the German idealism brain mm -hmm. bug, which is that the reason that you need the value theory, I mean, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of reasons you need, even the, even if you don't know what it is, even if you can't agree with each other about what it is, you need it because it says that history has a necessary form of appearance. That, that there is a necessity that is operating in and through history that is going to bring us to some determinate place. I mean, mm -hmm. 
that is so i mean you know both Kant and hegel are are concerned with the question of of the necessary appearance of freedom and that's puzzling because freedom seems to be the antithesis of necessity right i mean there seems to be this dichotomy according to which if things are necessary then they're unfree because they're determined um, and so freedom would have to be the opposite of necessity. Um, both Kant and Hegel uh, want to try to show that freedom is necessary, and that's not a contradiction. You know, in Kant, that's the categorical imperative. In Hegel, that's, well, it's all of Hegel, in, you know, s supposed to demonstrate that there is a necessary overcoming of necessity that is operating in history. I think Marx is com working completely within that paradigm. Um, as much as he wants to claim to have escaped, you know, inverted Hegel or whatever, I mean, he's he's really applying the same. He's he's indebted to the myth. He just wants to tell the myth in a slightly different way. And so, the, and so, there needs to be something necessary about history, which means about economic development. And in order to talk about things being necessary, you need to have units in which they are necessarily denominated. Because if you can't even count things, then how are you going to, you know, come up with a theory about how they're necessary? And, but I, you know, but I think it turns out that really there are no necessary units in which to denominate any economic phenomena. I mean, all possible units in which we might count economics, measure magnitudes of good, um, mm -hmm. are, 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 are themselves directly expressions of power. They, they are not objective necessary categories that mask power. They are directly contingent expressions of power. They can be one way. They can be another way. It really just depends on who's in the accounting office and what the, what the accounting framework is and who has the power to make their accounting framework the one that matters. Um, and so there is, this kind, there is a kind of deep contingency about the form of appearance of economic phenomena that is like anathema to the Marxist project, the level of its basic philosophical structure, um, kind of coming out of Kant and Hegel. This is this is the view that I'm that I'm kind of working towards developing. So, you so I, I guess the, your objection there makes sense. Um, what I would ask you is, uh, why why does this also entail a critique of MMT? Um, although I would, you know, my suspicion. It is that the deep history of MMT has, you know, had less to do with Minsky, less to do with Warren Mosler, uh, and a lot more to do with the neo-Kantian thinking in German historical school, and that that uh, Karl Friedrich Na uh, Knapp is actually got some other assumptions that were that are kind of dropped um, by the, the the English institutionalist and you know Keynesians that that pick him up. Um, cause he's not really picked up by the later German historical school. Interestingly, he's kind of picked up by Schacht in practice, but even that's kind of in practice more than for people who don't know, he was the German finance minister. Um, but what I find interesting there is like, we can't, uh, we, you know, if you're like, oh, Marxism, well, we can't exclude the German historical school from all this, uh, German idealism being relevant either, because while they're not Hegelians, they are by and large Kantians, or they are, are they even quasi Marxist? So, um, yeah. so do you think that's related? And because there's a lot of ways in which, like, um, I also hear MMTers will talk about money and, and they will like make assertions about like, well, this much money in the economy will mean this much employment. And I'm like, that's still on, that still seems to be based off this idea that, that this balance sheet automatically equals this. And you're skipping all the interim things in the middle. So like Warren Moser right now says, well, because of payouts on, on the high, on um, high bond rates, that that's why unemployment's not gone down because it's injected in the back end 0.7 uh, 0.6 trillion uh dollars off the title national debt i'm not sure that's a very back of the napkin calculation that he does but then i i you know my my immediate pushback on that is like well that's just inverting the whole idea that the private debt sucks the money out entirely and isn't paying out like somehow you would you would expect 
that if it's one to one, then it actually shouldn't matter at all because the the private debt should actually eat up the additional stuff dumped into the economy and it should have no effect whatsoever. That's not the case. Um, why that's not the case seems to be way more complicated than what you're saying. And it has to do with the fact that most of this seems to be looking at this in terms of just balance sheets. Like all we're looking at is balance sheets. Like, like, and, and maybe the, the current, the current situation seems to match what we think the balance sheet should say right now. Although I'll also point out almost all of these explanations are post hoc. So, you know, do with that, do with that what you will. Um, I can make a lot of post hoc explanations work simultaneously. Uh, as I said in the, my, uh, my episode about this, I can also look at the quote declining rate of profits in, in GDP or whatever, and make that work too. Like, with with empirical evidence even though both things can't be true like and i can make the numbers work both ways which tells me which made me more sympathetic to your uh preposition your proposition that maybe all of this is just like the numbers are hiding power relations anyway um but what is your critique of mmt in light of this yeah. well i mean one thing i will say about the the, the profits thing i mean even if you could measure real profits, which I'm skeptical of it, suppose you could measure them and they were falling. I don't think there's any necessary reason to think that that matters. I mean, mm -hmm. why why should you care about profits rather than asset prices? If profits are falling and asset prices are rising, what's the problem? Right? So, I mean, there's, there's a bit of an assumption that what the ruling class cares about is profits, and maybe they don't. I mean, this is this is one of the things that I've been thinking about for a while that initially made me skeptical of, or, or looking for places outside of Marxism was, you know, the, the what about asset prices thing? I mean, what if what if there is no simple connection between, well, real substance production stuff and asset prices, you know, I mean, if, there doesn't seem to be a, a, like empirical. There doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be certainly certainly there's no consensus about it among anybody. Pick pick mm -hmm. mainstreamers, pick Marxists, pick whoever you want. There's no consensus about it. Um, so there doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be, you know, I mean, there's the other thing, you know, if, if everything is getting worse, like suppose, you know, if basically what's happening in the economy is not that we're overcoming necessity and becoming the necessity of nature and liberating our creative potential, if what's basically happening in the economy is that we're shitting in all of the water and fucking up the planet, then if I were a powerful person, I just want to get the clean water and get the land and just sit there and wait. And I wouldn't care if I made any profits or not. The only thing I would care about is if I could fund my bat, my fund my book. I just, I just, I just need to break even on making sure that my revenues pay my interest. I don't know if um, this this comes. There's that. There's the show I started watching, Yellow Yellowstone, about the guy mm -hmm. with the big ranch. And this this comes up. This is this is presented as his attitude, right? Is I'm not in it to make a profit. I'm in it to preserve my dynastic wealth. Um, anyway, so so I, I think there's there's a bit of an unnecessary, an unwarranted assumption that profits are what the ruling class should care about. I mean, what if they don't? <laughs> um, what if what if profits are just for paying interest and 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 you just want to break even on your on your survival constraint and what you really want to do is get the assets and, and hoard them. I mean, there's, there is no, why not? But the, but the reason that we can't think that is because, well, the paradigm of economics sort of assumes historically, and this is, this goes, this is again, the Hegel myth that the, it assumes that these urban capitalists have permanently defeated the landlords as the sort of agents of history. And, and the question is how the proletariat is going to succeed in turn you know, but what if the landlords just go back to being the agent, you know, the agent of history like they've always been? And then the logic of it changes. But anyways, this is not the question. You right. This is a, this is so. the core of the, the neo-feudal debate. And what, uh, one of the things I've gotten to as I've dug into the neo-feudal debate is I realized that um, in English common law, and I don't know why this didn't occur to me because I kind of I kind of know this, but it never occurred to me as important before. In English common law, like a commodity and a rent can literally be kind of measured the same way because I can trade a, a source of rents as a commodity, which totally means that the distinction isn't that meaningful, right? Like, so this whole debate over what counts as a rent and what counts as a commodity, which drives 
a ton of these debates about profitability, right? Um, well, if I can trade a if I can trade a, a rent source as a commodity on the market, then then what matters actually is when I'm valorizing it and what I'm doing with it. So that's actually kind of like totally, you know, it, it's not something I can objectively say outside of the point of sale, this is doing this and acting like this. And when I realized that I was like, oh, okay. So, so there's a problem with this conception of a clear distinction between the rentier economy and the capitalist economy to begin with. And yes. like Marx kind of flirts with that in capital volume too, but doesn't really like, it's like something he kind of plays with. And then the role of the state in all this, he just doesn't deal with at all. So like, one of the things that I really started thinking about from you is like, okay, we have to deal with the cost of setting up markets, setting up currency exchanges and maintaining that. That's, that's not free. And it doesn't just happen. Like, um, right. you know, well, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen. And there's not one ideal way to do it. There's, there's a number of different ways that you can do it and how you set it up has different effects, but, but Marx, you know, Mm -hmm. For Marx, it, you know, the logic of it emerges. It's, it's this, he has this a priori analysis about what emerges that, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, things are traded and these are the necessary, you know, it's, it's a kind of Kantian categories that he's developing in the early parts of capital. And, and, and so if, if it's, if it, if the institutional arrangements of the system matter, then you, you can't construct that argument. You'd have to go look at those. But I mean, so, okay, here's, so, there, so there, there are these deep problems. How do you distinguish between productive and unproductive labor? These are distinctions that need to be introduced in order to make arguments work, but they aren't found. They, with the more you tug on them, the more they they fall apart. They're very unsatisfactory. How right. do we tell the difference between and the relation between assets and commodities? What's the difference between them? Again, another. The more you can come up with these, you can do you can do Talmud with it all day and 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 have a lot of fun. But you know the so the issue I think. And, and this relates to the MMT stuff, is that the MMTers think that they can get rid of these value theories, these conservation laws, mm -hmm. and preserve, but nonetheless preserve the elite class consensus that the value theories make possible. So value theories make it possible for the elites to agree about what their common interests are in a way that rises above kind of factional disputes between, you know, landlords versus London merchants, et cetera, and so forth. Right. I mean, and in, in our day, those, those conflicts are kind of like red state extractive industries versus coastal finance techs kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's sort of the big division in the, in the factional division in the U S in order for those two elites to agree about anything, they have to agree that they can measure GDP is a kind of value thing. And, and they also have to agree that there's some sort of constraint that limits what the state can do, you know, in sort of, in, in order for the state to do something first, the value has to be generated in the private sector and then the state kind of extracts it. And, and so you have to, you have to set up these value concepts as these conservation laws about something other than balance sheets, right? It's, it's, it's a theory about what is underneath the balance sheets. You have to have this theory in order to produce an elite class consensus. The, the Marxist theory says, okay, I'm going to take on board the assumptions of the elite class consensus and show you how your system can't be stable. That's the goal of the argument. The MMTers mm -hmm. want to say, well, in order to, the MMTers are the opposite. I mean, what they're saying is our allegiance to these value concepts is producing elite instability. The elites are mad at each other because the state is constrained because of these value theories. And if we want to repair elite class consensus, then we need to just do functional finance and then we can make everybody happy. But I, I, I think the issue is that they, they don't understand the important role that these concepts they want to dispense with play in creating the possibility of elite class consensus. Um, and then they're surprised when MMT is divisive among the elites, right? Right. Or like parts of it will be, will be actually advised for policy, but only stuff that might lead to asset inflation or something like that. Like, 
like it's never fully taken on and there are some materials of like oh, okay class exists we have to deal with that or there's and i'm like well power conflicts exist you know yes classes is, is probably what i would say you know i'm a marxist in this sense it's the primary terrain but it's not the only terrain the, furthermore a lot of these classes uh particularly the bourgeoisie uh is highly divided and always has been and and the idea that that they understand their interest in a unified way is kind of in and of itself nutty but it also misses one of the fundamental things that you pointed out that goes all the way back to the beginning money is valuable if it's unequally distributed that's part of the point so any attempt to equally distribute it no matter how you do it and maintain the elites is it is almost impossible because you're asking the the people who have the controls of power to basically equalize power like in the form of this mediation through money and that like why the hell would anyone do that like unless they were forced to buy a gun like it just doesn't really make sense yeah um so so it's you know, so again, so I remember in your when I watched your MMT thing, um, mm-hmm. you know, you you were saying something about the value theories, and and you referred to the you know the aggregate theory. It's it's not it's not determining the individual prices. It's ag- true at the aggregate, et cetera, and so forth. I, I agree that that's what Marx's theory says. Mm-hmm. The re- one of the reasons I wanted to come on and talk to you today, I want to I want to I want to push you off that that because because the it, you can't aggregate it. There's no the the any possible aggregation involves a fallacy of composition, and so there's no there's no way to talk about aggregation of, of these quantities um, because because of, of all the things we've been talking about, and and so that's a problem. I mean the the idea that we can aggregate that the that the law of you know the, the value theory of labor is true at the level of aggregate is the sort of conservation law that. Adam Smith and Ricardo and thinkers like that posit in order to try to constrain government finance. Um, but you know, but the but the problem is that there is no saying what would the value of money be if everyone had it equally is assuming a contradiction. I mean, that is a contradictory statement. Money is money because not everybody has it. If everybody had it, it wouldn't be money. Period. And so. The value of money is an effect of its distribution, um, which means that there is this unresolvable power component in any possible measurement, quantitative measurement of any economic phenomena. I mean, unless you are literally just doing, um, you know, you're, you're counting bushels of wheat and stuff like that. I mean, you can do that. I mean, but but that's not that's not what that's not what. That's not what economists mean when they talk about real quantities. I mean, they 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 mean something else, and 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 we can't produce it. And so and so this is now this is brings us you know, into some of the stuff that we've been talking about with Bichler and Nixon and that kind of. And it's why my view is similar to theirs. Um, we've come at it from very different places. I, I um, some of some of the stuff that they say, I'm not qualified to even evaluate their arguments. So I, and I don't know, but but there's something important about what they're saying. And whether it's exactly their theory or a theory that sounds like it, I think we need to we need to understand that there are no objective quantities in economics that are fully abstracted from power, which means fully abstracted from distribution positionality. That means the quantification of the economy is something that accountants do. It's not something that happens naturally in the economy. It's something that accountants do, and they could do differently. And and if we're going to understand the economy from a critical perspective, we need to understand that. Now, we do need to think about real things in the world and not just balance sheets. There's, I agree with you. There's something unsatisfactory about that, right? I mean, to just say, mm-hmm. you know, to just say, look, sectoral balance is identity. Public sector uh, red ink is private sector black ink. Okay. But now we're back to William Petty. Okay. You've got more money, but what do you want with it? You know, what do you want to do with it? Um, right. There, there, you know, what is it? What does it mean to you? How how are you using money in order to exercise power? And and we need to trace all of all of that. And that's something the imitators aren't interested in because they, you know, that they, they're they have a political agenda that is fulfilled by simply 
getting rid of these austerity value constraints and spending more money. But, but yeah, I mean, there's something, you know, so I, but I think that basically where I think this all leads is that we need to think about the economy in more concrete terms, in terms of, you know, like these theorists that we've been talking about, I mean, they have a difference between the agricultural sector and the manufacturing sector in their theory that alone like puts them ahead of a lot of modern economic theories that just have one sector in them, right? So even just realizing that there's different sectors in the economy, I mean, that's the beginning place for what I would think of as, as a more materialist analysis. And I know Marx has a theory of rent in volume three or whatever, but I mean, you know, he, it's not, it doesn't play a central role in his argument. Uh, like, whereas Ricardo and Malthus are very much arguing about agriculture. Marx doesn't spend very much time arguing about the in fact, he's kind of disdainful of arguments about diminishing returns and agricultural productivity and that and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was actually I was just reading Kohei Zito on this, and he's trying to say that Marx, because of his Stoyle's uh, studies of of German scientists, and that th was was actually kind of actually you know wanted to dismiss Ricardo's theory of returns, but really kind of accepts it. I mean, uh, Ricardo Malthus debate, but really kind of accepts it. And I read it, and I'm like. I get where you see that he was reading that and I get why you say that he was concerned about soil depletion and diminishing returns there. Uh, but uh, I don't get where you say that he ever accepted that because it does seem like he still thinks that like infinite, infinite gross is possible by, uh, you know, um, without considering the soil and it's this new soil. Fossil, science. Nitrogen. <laughs> hmm? Fossil nitrogen. I mean, right. It's just it, it it it's it's totally, um. Uh, it, there's this uh, Leibig is the is the is the notes that Kohei Sato is really writing this off of, and I'm just like, you know, it's a big leap to say that that Marx understands that, and thus we have a Marxian argument for for like uh more you know. Uh, more balanced development, uh, careful of certain kinds of growth, et cetera. Uh, where, whereas I'm increasingly like, why are we talking about growth about this at all? Our degrowth or anything. We have to talk about a completely different way of dealing with this yes. problem. Like, yes, yes, yes. That's, that's why I'm so passionate about all of this, because I think it matters for us, right? I mean, even the, what gets called degrowth, I think, is sometimes on either side of this, but there's but there's ways in which you might talk about degrowth that accepts that there's such a thing as growth. I think we really need to challenge the idea that there's such a thing as growth. Um, it's never been a very clear concept. When you look at the history of how this concept developed, it's it's full of he real head scratcher kind of stuff. I mean, uh, undecidable distinctions, arbitrary pronouncements, other kinds of things like that. So, and you know, but but the problem is that this this puts hard questions on the table and in particular it's hard because we can no longer necessarily say that the trajectory of history that we're on is one that's leading to human freedom mm -hmm. i mean i mean that's what we have to in a way give up in order to dispense with that concept because Basically, growth, the idea of growth is the explanation for how everybody can be free in, in the sense of getting whatever they want all the time, right? Well, we'll all be free because we'll all just we'll just have so much stuff that 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 everybody can get what they want all the time. I mean, I mean, that's sort of what growth promises. To, to say, well, growth doesn't is not a really a well-founded concept. Um, there's this inherent positionality in in well in desire i mean you want stuff because other people don't have it i mean look look into your soul and tell me that there's nothing of, that you don't ever enjoy having something because you have it and somebody else doesn't I, I think everybody experiences this um you know so so there's this inherent antagonism that's constitutive of of desire and uh, what we you know what we want what we desire what we're trying to produce and, and the problem is that if we start talking about material stuff, you know, how much water do we have? How much food do we have? How much, how much airplane trips can we afford for each person to have? How much the stuff? I mean, we're going to say you can't have what you want. I mean, and, and now we have said 
that there exist fundamental zero sum relations in political order. And that's a problem because that is the kind of structure that is potentially productive of enormous amounts of violence. And, right. and so, and so that's, you know, that's the issue is that, is that this whole myth of growth economics, all this stuff is basically designed to tell a story that explains how, po how political policy can be geared towards getting everybody what they want with no, no zero sum relations, no contradictions, et cetera, and so forth. So, so as, as much as people like to criticize economics and as much as economics claims itself to be this pessimistic discourse that's interested in zero sum trade-offs and stuff, it's, it's really not the case. I mean, economics is incredibly optimistic um, in, in the sense that it, yeah, I mean, it, it sees history as this process of the overcoming of necessity as the necessary overcoming of necessity. And I think if we give that up, the, the question is whether all we're left with is necessity and we just have to kill each other over it. And, and that's a possibility that nobody likes to think about very hard. So that's why they continue to believe and value and economics and growth and all this stuff. That's, that's kind of where I'm at with this set of set of questions. But I, but I think, you know, I think if we take that challenge seriously to say, look, I mean, can we make an accounting? of what we have and, and what our limits are and ensure that we remain within the limits. We're, we're no longer talking about freedom, but we are talking about survival. And I don't know, I'd like to survive. I don't know how other people feel about it, but I'd like to survive. And I think it's a serious question whether we're going to or not. So that's kind of where all this leads. <laughs> um, The set of the set of incentives when you when you talk about this in zero sum terms of development uh, is interesting, and I you know I always talk about anthropological studies of more egalitarian uh, societies, almost all of which are ancient, by the way. I mean, like that's the that's the thing. It is it does dominate human history, but it all dominates human history because someone figured out how to compel other people to do agriculture. And let's be honest about that. That was compelling other people to do it. If you look at uh, agricultural societies decline in health, they didn't get people to do it because they volunteered, despite what people may tell you towards this progress narrative. That's absolutely not the case. Anyone who's looked at bones would know it. Um, and, and by the way, we're going to be we're going to be looking at uh, all of this origins of agriculture in an upcoming course at Denver School taught by Jules DeLille on human origins that's coming up in the fall. So uh, awesome. Yeah, because anyway. yeah, that's been something I've been on for a while. I. I I'm not one of these people who thinks that we can undo that. I'm not a primitivist, but like um, it is something when I think, okay, when we think about what egalitarian societies do, the one thing I will, what I will tell you is they are probably more com competitive than you like actually. Um, and in many ways they have to sublimate and deal with a whole lot of violence. Like they do have to have pretty strong social norms and incentives to deal with violence. And that is not bringing in competition with outside groups, which is the thing that's almost always left out of this equation is like, yes, there are ways humans have ways to neutralize competition between outside groups through expansions of Sogalic kinship, but you know, these sorts of things we, you, you, you know, all about this, but, but for example, when I always talk about like my Hobbesian assumptions, just it's like, oh, I don't have a Hobbesian assumption about individuals. I don't think individuals are necessarily out in a nasty Brutus and short way, but I do think groups of people are like, I basically think Hobbes is right about the way collective groupings of people, states, but also sub-state actors, frankly, actually act towards each other. Whereas like individuals with high social trust don't, but groups of individuals where their where social trust declines precipitously with outside groups do and you have to figure out a way to deal with that and mitigate it um and i think you're absolutely right about you know about the the fear of that but there's also a real sense in which like if you don't mitigate that and i don't think value is going to mitigate it right like that's i remember reading that you know the the climate leviathan book and thinking like it was far too optimistic given current concerns that we were going to have a a leviathan super state and i was like yeah you're lucky if you get that you're actual the, the, the book's argument is that we're going to have climate x well yeah well it well the book's hope it's that like if you actually talk to joel rainwright we're not going to really he doesn't think we're going to get that he thinks we're going to get 
uh, the climate Leviathan. And, and my response to him is like, that's too optimistic. Yeah, well, I wish that'd be nice. <laughs> Like yeah. the idea that you think that you think these national bourgeoisies or whatever are are going to do that before it is really too late for most people is kind of really optimistic. <laughs> you know, climate. You know, climate X. They can't even really. On one hand, there's all this. You know, that's the section. Like, well, we should look at how indigenous people did this and blah 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 blah. And I'm super sympathetic to that, but I'm also like, yeah, but. You haven't really explained how we get back there um, unless you just kind of have this like David Graeber, David Wingrow, like, oh, we just need to believe in it more. <laughs> like, And I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm just not even when I study equality, I'm not that optimistic that most of it's about just belief. <laughs> like, yeah. So, but one, you know, one thing that I this has come up in our courses before, you know, I mean, one thing that you observe sometimes in egalitarian cultures is that they destroy wealth um, yeah because because if you don't want to become unequal just destroy the wealth and then nobody has any wealth to accumulate in their lineage and there you go now you're equal so you know but 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 we imagine that we can be equal but preserve the myth that we're overcoming the necessity of nature and and so we're gonna so we're both going to accumulate wealth and be equal that's the that's the idea um I think there are serious questions about whether that is the way that we should be approaching this problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at, at minimum. Um, yeah, th th that's my. That's why when everyone talks about gay luxury space communism, are infinite markets forever? I just sort of laugh. Like it's just like it's like I, I just no. Like neither one of those visions. Uh, for one, I mean, I know I'm going to be uh, being accused of taking a metaphor too literally whenever I talk about entropy. That's what everyone does. Like, oh, you're you're literalizing a physics metaphor. But I'm like, OK, but like the laws of motion actually really do apply to everything. Why? <laughs> so. So and yes, I get that there's the sun and the earth is not a closed system. And like because of the sun, labor can be I get it. But like, really, though, <laughs> like, there are limits here. Um, most of which, by the way, is the accumulated dead energy and not even dead labor. I mean, literally fossil energy that's accumulated from billions of years of other dead things, which we are going through and which we found no equally dense source to replace. Like, while I am hopeful that we can mitigate some of the uh, of like trying to go back to the 15th century or whatever, um, with with renewables i'm also pretty realistic that none of them are going to be as energy dense as fossil fuels um yeah what without without pretty significant risks such as like nuclear power where yes it is as energy dense but you got a whole lot of other problems you have to deal with um well, so it's like you know there's we're gonna out of out of the frying pan into the fire is the best case scenario for us. But yeah, I mean, I you know, I think, you know, I mean, I think we need to. I guess you know, the question for me is how do you develop a theory of, you know, of of political desires that that replaces what we all feel is important about Marxism in a way that gets rid of this baggage of these value theories of the Hegel myth of all these other things. And, you know, in, in a way that says, look, I mean, you know, maybe we can accept our limits and, and we're going to have some food and some clean air and some, and some fresh water and, and we're going to be happy with it. You know, I mean, that's not, that's not what people get into, at least most people, you know, it's not what they get into far left politics for. Um, but it, I, you know, I, how do we, how do we reorient? Our, our vision around around survival rather than freedom. I don't know. I mean, that's that's. I think that's an important question. But but again, I mean, I mean, this is if you if you say I care more about my survival than my freedom, you're now on the wrong side of the master-slave dialectic.